Hello everyone. Hi guys, welcome back. Welcome back, it's been a while since we've done a video. And what are we doing a video on today, Gary? Well, um, so we're gonna do a psychological review of the film, The Mancurian Candidate. Yes. Um, and it's the original version from 1962, not the Denzel Washington remake from That's the right. 90s. That's right, and particularly we're going to be paying attention to the symbolism in the film and in the context of a um, concept of Jung's called the Dragon Mother, sometimes called the Terrible Mother or the Devouring Mother. And as we go along you'll see how this psychological concept is, is borne out by the film. Um, one of the reasons that we're interested in the symbolism is that symbolism provides us some sort of access to the unconscious in the same way as if we might be trying to interpret dreams. Um, it sort of shortcuts the conscious psyche and we're, we're able to get some access to deeper truths and the unknown. And, and this particular film is quite heavy in symbolism. It is um, indeed. So that helps give us something to talk about. It is indeed. So we're going to jump right in and we're going to try and sort of work through key scenes in the film. We're going to go through chronologically. Um, it has to be said though, this will be spoilerific. So if you haven't seen it and you prefer to see it before we chat, press pause, go and watch it. Otherwise, watch this, hopefully this is why you should go and watch it. It is a great film, uh, but this is primarily going to be a psychological review, not a standard film review. Yeah, go and, or watch it afterwards. Um, what, what we're trying to get at here is to see if, you know, you might, you might be a kind of anti-psychological person, um, you might not want to think about those things, but what we're trying to get at here is if what we're saying when we're addressing the symbolism chimes with you or resonates with you and maybe aspects of your own life and thereby giving credence to this um, concept of Jung's. Um, so we'll jump straight in and the first real scene we get is um, the character of uh, Raymond Shaw and Marco and Raymond Shaw's going into they're in Korea and they're going into a sort of officer's mess situation and Shaw he's, he's got some rank in the army and we see that he's a bit of a stick in the mud and a bit of a prude the rest of the sort of his army buddies although they're not really his buddies because he's kind of out on his own. His platoon. Yeah, the rest of his platoon are enjoying themselves with these uh, local women drinking. It's, it's kind of a, a, a brothel-ish kind of a situation uh, with the bar and the ladies around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he's actually, he's, he's trying to shut the whole thing down. And he, he's, he's going, well, let's, let's stop this and stop having fun. This is, you know, not how we do things. And he's even approached by a couple of women who are sort of going, come on, relax a little bit, you know. Um, and uh, we, we even hear um, <coughs> you know, after he's tried to shut it down, we even hear one of the uh, his army friends say, uh, "Oh, he hasn't got a woman at home either. He hasn't got a girl at home." Mm -hmm. uh, so he's a lonely character, and his relationships don't tend to work out. And uh, and as we go along, we'll see how the influence of the mother is affecting uh, his relationships. Yeah. So with with the Dragon Mother in the film. His mother is played by Angela Lansbury uh, from Murder She Wrote. Um, she does a, a great job, but 
the her role in the film is can't be understated. She's a big influence on him and what's going on in in the narrative. And wider society, but we'll get to that. Yeah, and wider society. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about the mothers during this podcast, and it, it, it might seem like we're being really down on mothers or attacking mothers or that sort of thing. But what we're really trying to do is get at the root pathology and the root causes. It's not a personalisation. It's like not we're not going to say mothers are bad or anything like that. Um, we're trying to get at the psychological situation um, and, and the importance of the mother's role and to reveal the it. Child. So when it goes wrong, we have a chance of addressing it. And what I would say is it's important to bear in mind that the mother is the primary caregiver. The first introduction of the child to the world. And there's a lot of power in that situation. And if that power is misused or goes awry, then it can have profound psychological implications. Okay? Um, but we, we'll cover that a bit more. So, the second scene. Yeah, there's a there's a theme throughout this movie, and it's um, one of a lot of unconscious metaphors. So there's a lot of symbolism that relates to the unconscious, and uh, mystery and inversion of events. So there's a murkiness about it, and things are turned on. Things are often turned on their head. Yeah. And, and when we see this, we can think of it as the unconscious and the unknown, or the unconscious and the unknown coming to light in the world because it's unaddressed. So, so it's like a, it's a battle. So there is a consciousness. A tension and a battle there. Uh, and the next scene, we see the patrol. You should say something about this next scene, Corin. Um, just have a patrol and they are led by a um, Korean gentleman and he, which is weird because they're fighting they're fighting the Koreans <laughs> fighting so the Korean. they've got like a local helper who knows the area um, but it turns out he, he misguides them um, I think there's a it talks about a quicksand or the, or the lake yeah they're trying to negotiate this quicksand where we see uh bodies of water or uh, bogs or quicksand that can often represent a kind of unconscious depth that they're... And it's, it's something repeated a couple of times in this film, yeah. so it's obviously something I'm aware of when they made it, I would have thought. And a danger inherent in that, and it's sort of inherent danger. Now, um, so there's, they're negotiating this unconscious mire, and, and then they actually get knocked unconscious, as if to ram home the metaphor, they get knocked unconscious themselves. Literally, yeah. <laughs> Literally. And seemingly by people who look like the same, they're on the same side, uh, their own troops. Um, yeah, so like you could even see that again, make perhaps as uh, fighting yourself, battling yourself, um, some sort of internal struggle. Yeah. Um, or the self fighting for recognition. Yeah. Um, a, a buried self fighting for recognition. Uh, then at the end of the scene, um, a helicopter comes in to, to take them away, and it has the Chinese communist star on it. Um, so they're captured by the Russian, uh, well, the Soviets and the Chinese communists, taken to Mancurian Island, where they are brainwashed but before we get to the brainwashing scene I mean that's the key point it's like they look like there's this deception they, they look like uh, troops from their own side but if we're being told that they're from the side that they're actually fighting um, so the film then cuts to this, this sort of scene of a kind of returning hero um, and um, we see Shaw 
coming out of the plane. It's a big, it's got a big American flag on the side, and we see it like a reception committee. It's all this hubbub, and the press are there, big crowd. And like, if you, if you think about any kind of typical American homecoming or political celebration, loads of people, American flags, people waving stuff, trumpets. Yeah, um, there's a lot of pomp. There's a lot of show. Yeah. Um, but is it? Is everything real here? And that uh, Shaw has a little aside on the steps. I think he says, I don't feel like a hero or so, something like that, or for, I feel like a puppet on display or something like that. So there's this emphasis on everything is not what it seems and it, it's a performance um, and not authentic. Um, and then we are uh, in, first introduced to the mother character and she breaks her way through the crowd and puts up a big banner that's hers and we get the sense that this is all her doing. This play, this unreality and that she's the one behind everything and in charge of this situation. She orchestrated the um, homecoming. Orchestrated is a good word, yeah. Mm. Um, so, and he, he, sure was not happy about this, you know, it's clear he's not happy about this, but can he do anything about it? Um, so, and then they sort of hustled away and they end up sort of in this taxi and we see that the um, stepfather character is also a senator, I think, in the film. and. Um, we see how the Lansbury character addresses these two men. Yeah, so she, <clears throat> obviously you have two quite successful, powerful men. The stepdad, he was a senator, the son who's just been awarded the Medal of Honor, which is the biggest honor you can get in the American Army. Um, and she kind of talks to them both like little children. Yeah. There's, there's, there's supposed to be symbols of masculinity. She refers to them, I think, as, bo as boys. Boys. Um, and there's this uh, sort of way of speaking of this uh, terrible mother character, which is often very performative and a kind of Look what I'm doing for you. I want nothing for myself. Um, uh, yeah. And it appeals to sort of greater, often appeals to a kind of greater authority that she's deriving power from. It's like. Yeah. Um, so she, she literally kind of invokes America, American dream, and yeah. um, maybe you, even religion up You should do this, not for me, <laughs> but for this, for God country for the betterment of the, the world political party betterment of the world sometimes even a kind of sanctified role of mother sometimes she'll even vote do this you know for the for the mother you know the, yeah, the the, um, um, but i want nothing for myself yeah it's i not, am so humble it's not it's not for yeah. me yeah. do what i say but it's not yeah. for me it's for the greater yeah. good um, uh, and we'll see this repeated in her behaviour. Um, and they're both, yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary. They're both treated as boys. Yeah, and I guess the stepdad is initially quite quiet. Um, so he's introduced slowly. He's kind of a fool character. Yeah. Um, so a weak character. Yeah. So when, when, when I talk about the influence of, of the mother, um, in, in a traditional family unit with a strong dad, there's more balance. Um, but when you have a weaker father figure or an absent father figure, then the influence of the mother's going to be even stronger. So whether she's doing right or whether she's doing wrong, it's going to have a, a much greater impact. And, so, and socialising that child to the world and, yeah. and allowing that child some more autonomy. Yeah. Um, so... 
we, we then see them uh, go on to this private uh, jet that they have, because they're, you know, they're in the world of politics and that sort of thing. And one of the things I noticed there is just on the way into the plane, um, the mother figure points out the double bed to her son. Extraordinary thing there. So there's a little hint of the Oedipal there. <laughs> um, just a very strange little aside. And we have the um, senator character. So make, making drinks, by the Making boy. drinks. But he's sort of like a... He's, he look, he's got a military hat on, but he looks like a sort of busboy or something. Yeah, I was about to say or that. Or a servant. A busboy, bar, bartender. Like a barman, yeah. And we see Shaw trying to rebel and trying to um, separate him. separate and make something for himself. And he talks about this, getting this uh, job at the newspaper. And this obviously needs to be immediately sh shut down by the, uh, by the, the Lansbury character. And um, again, we get this evocation of um, uh, these external threats. Um, and she says, oh, the terrible things, the, uh, He's really what's the top of a newspaper called? The publisher? <laughs> I don't know. Editor, uh, the terrible things he's written about Johnny. Johnny, the, so the husband. She's deflected. You're not going. I don't want you to do that because you'll get away from me, and I won't be able to use my power. It's uh, y you will hurt that person mm. over there. Yeah. So this is injunctive, and it's you will destroy this over there. You can't. You can't do that. Yeah. For moral reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so he's, she keeps trying to keep the control. Yeah. And mother. this is one of the things about why, you know, devouring mother is a good term. Because that it's important to be slightly empathetic towards this mother figure. Um, because, um, I mean, this is an insatiable need for power. This is an unending need for power, that it, and it can't be satiated. Um, and this is power that that mother feels they don't have in their life um, because of their own relationship to uh, to their own mother. to their own mother. Um, um, and she has a lack of a strong male partner yeah, to yeah. help her. Or and this can manifest in being ending up being quite a powerful per person because of that drive, but it's unending. It's unending if it's unaddressed and it's very destructive. Um, so the next we're introduced to the character of Marco a bit more, and he's having these. Uh, He's having these nightmares. Uh, Marco is played by the great Frank Sinatra. I mean, just wonderful in this film. He, he's a brilliant actor, yeah. as well as the singer. Yeah. He's a brilliant actor, he just has Frank Sinatra. And Lansbury's amazing as well. <laughs> you, know, you know what, I actually, I love Lansbury in this mm. film, and I hate Mary She Wrote, and I hate her in Mary She Wrote. Well, um, there's a, it's great to play the villain, I mean. <laughs> but she's great as, as the mother in this and the dragon mother, um, she just has the right air, yeah. some sort of mumsy quality about her. Yeah. Um, um, and maybe, maybe uh, you know, we, you don't know if she's seen that in her own life. You know, she might have very good access to, to knowing what that behaviour is like. Um, so Marco's having the nightmares, and we get this, we start to get this theme of repetition emerging. Um, a kind of that we might see as a kind of repeat trauma or a mantra or a kind of s things being stuck in their way and um, 
and also a false narrative. Okay, like a if the narrative can be repeated enough times, then maybe it will come true, even if it's false. Um, and, what, and what was it in his dreams? So, one of the motifs in this version and in the and in the remake is that they have this shared story about what happened to them in Korea. Yeah. And, I mean, this is interesting on, on an unconscious level, the kind of shared unconscious. Um, but it's exact. It's an, exactly the same story. And, you know, you have to ask the question, why would they all have the same dream? You know? Um, Collective unconscious. So that's, yeah. that's another Jungian. Yeah. Um, and we find it's they they've all undergone this this programming. Um, so then we see the first instance of the what happened to them after they were knocked unconscious and shipped off to Manchuria. Do you want to say something about that, Corin? About about the. Um, well, it opens on this sort of scene of like a garden and a mother's meeting. Yeah, I was, I was really confused when I first watched it. I, I, didn't, I didn't really have a clue what was going on. So it switches between, it's like a quaint mother's meeting talking about hydrangeas. And then it would change slightly and there'd be like a Chinese army general. And then there'd be some soldiers and it kept kind of switching between them. And I think the the kind of the room changed, but only slightly. Um, and then um, when it was the the general speaking, um, the soldiers would reply, but they would say, um, "Ma'am" or "Mom." Was it "Mom"? "Mom." "Mom." Um, <clears throat> so the first time I watched it, I, I didn't actually understand what was going on. I was just confused. <clears throat> So this is the dream sequence, and it's the same one for the, the platoon that are having these kind of dream flashbacks. Um, so I guess the the women in the scene, the mothers, they're kind of dreaming about their own mothers. Um, and this is what it's about. And it's, it's, in, it's important, this is key to the programming. So they're getting in at this child level. Yeah. They're getting in like this terrible mother, and a good mother, um, but in a very formative stage. Yeah, and I think that's also... The very malleable stage when the mother is the child's whole world. So it's, it's, it's also making some sort of comment on the mother-child relationship as well. Uh, and in being programmed from a young age. And the mother literally has power of life and death over the child. So... This is an extremely potent um, force, and they are circumvent just as the terrible mother is. These uh, mind control people are it's another metaphor of that, so they're circumventing that, getting in at the child level under hypnosis, stage, yeah. and <clears throat> using that energy to misdirect the, the uh, troops. Um, I think that one of the things I found kind of cool and interesting as well is um, I can't remember the name of the black um, platoon guy off the top of my head but in his dreams it's, his dream is exactly the same but the mother figures are black um, mother figures Yeah. and that's a, like one of the kind of well known things that people say we always dream in our own ethnicity Right. Um, which I found interesting to see yeah. in the film. I thought it was a nice yeah. little touch. Yeah, it's personal. Um, mm. So that was kind of cool. And that was a quite, I think it helped me to notice um, it was more about the mother figures when I was trying to work out the first time I saw it. And we should say it's personal because this is representing what they see. Exactly. And right. their interpretation and their embodying this yeah. on a personal level. It's not like a group. Uh, Although it's a shared experience, it's not that they're, they're not acting as a group in that sense. 
Um, and also, as we find out later on, it has different effects on on different uh, members of the troop based on their own personal experiences with their mother and whether that's been an arrested experience, uh, interrupted, or they've had a healthy, mature yeah. childhood. And, and also their general relationship with women and uh, partners, female yeah. partners. Um, so we see the first image of, I mean, it's, it's kind of imaginary, but we see the first image of um, Shaw shuffling. Oh, right. There's a little motif that, that um, comes up in the movie, and it's part of his uh, programming that happens later on. Um, and we see the mother, the Chinese fella, um, give uh, Shaw the scarf to strangle one of his. Um, one of his uh, troop mates, and uh, and this comes after the shuffling. So the shuffling is part of the programming, and then this scarf, which obviously seems to me quite a feminine uh, image, you know, um, and it's sort of symbolic of. Uh, this is the will of the mother, not necessarily the will of. The child or sure um, it's a tool from the mother to act the mother's will yeah and uh, so it's her a, power in the world so it's in, in a way it's the kind of symbolism of that is quite overt once you kind of watch it a few times or you know see a couple of the dream sequences that's all the influence of of the mother so you've got a whole bunch of them yeah. Stood there and then he kind of mixes with the Chinese general who it's, it's they a, call Mom. It's a feminine weapon. Yeah. Um, he's not strangling the guy with his hand, bare hands. Yeah, which, you know. Um, okay. And then we move on to, so Marco's been having these dreams and he's having a sort of army psych Evaluation. evaluation. Mm. And what's interesting about this is the Marco is the character who is actually waking up and getting some sense of the truth. But as he's doing so, the machine, the state or the army doesn't believe him. Um, <laughs> they've all been tricked. So in some sense, the army is mad and Marco is awake. But he's the one who's being treated as if he's mad. Yeah, so this it's this kind of complete play on the the unconscious and the conscious yeah. throughout the film, which is done brilliantly in my opinion. Um, really smart. So it's it, in some ways it's quite subtle. So Marco's slowly becoming conscious of of his dreams and trying to make sense of them. The real world and the army and stuff are unconscious and and kind of trying to suppress it. Yeah. And not listen. And they're acting as a sort of, you know, you know, kind of, I mean, the, even the metaphor of the army, it's like, it takes orders. It kind of acts unconsciously, it takes orders. I mean, even the, even the idea of it, how, them having a psych about seems slightly uneasy. It's like, what, the army? Are they capable of doing that, you know? Yeah. Especially then. Yeah. Um... um so then we see uh, this sort of political press conference and um, the buffoon um, senator is making a buffoon of himself. Marco's been sent there to try and rein him in, but he doesn't manage to do a very jo good job of it. Um, and the camera pans over and we see who is behind the scenes and we see the Lansbury character there. Yeah, uh, behind so, the TV monitor, so I think, orchestrating um, events. Is John, Johnny, is it Johnny Iceland? Yeah. So the senator, um, I think he's he starts going on about 
there's 205 communists that I can name. It's obviously going to be a big thing in the press conference. So he's just dropped this kind of bomb and Marco hasn't dealt with it. Then he goes backstage um, and someone says, how many was it? And then he says a different number. Yeah, he doesn't, it doesn't really matter. He just made it up. He it's, just, it's for show. It's for show and it re- really is for show because we find out, uh, you know, we who, find out it was, who's really <laughs> working with the communists. So it's, it's that kind of motif of, um, which we sometimes see what we saw earlier on, where uh, under the reign of the terrible mother, the um, strategy is to accuse others. Others point in the other direction. Of what you're doing yourself, to mask what you're doing yourself. Um, um, yeah, so she. Because it can't be addressed, because it's so terrible for the terrible mother. To, to go in and address that is so it's what? better to just run right in the world and create mayhem and chaos address herself yeah just for the power just for the illusion of power even yeah yeah so Lansbury's controlling the senator and I think they even allude to she's you know high up in 10 different kind of charity organisations and all that kind of stuff that works in America for show. Which is another iteration of it, if this. It's like, in the absence of being able to care for the child, I will make protestations and shows of how much I care. About other stuff. So, yeah. um, t- t- you know, I will look, I will look in this, in this pseudo way like the perfect mother. Like the perfect mother, perfectly in control, but the perfectly in control, perfectly yeah. caring and loving. Yeah, all these badges, these uh, symbols, um, rather than actual empathy for the child, yeah. actual empathy for herself as well. Yeah, um, facing yourself. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of psychology and um, psychoanalysis is is about repression and people kind of not looking inwards. So with the Lansbury character, um, everything's outwards. It's all completely outwards. So let's move on to the, one of the big symbols in the film. And we saw a hint of it earlier on. And uh, with the shuffling, and we get the first instance of uh, the character of Shaw uh, playing solitaire. And there's a lot to read from the symbol. And the key trigger card is the Red Queen, the The Dragon Queen. The Queen of Diamonds. The Queen of Diamonds. Um, And this speaks to it as well. I mean, um, diamonds, symbol of wealth, of material power. It's not Queen of Hearts. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, you know, it's not empathy, it's worldly power and, um, and, and also the fact that he's playing solitaire, so, it, so Shaw's can't form real relationships. Yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant um, symbol, like this, so, this film is so clever in a way it doesn't. Yeah. Um, he's a solitary guy. Can't really form relationships, yeah. and he's playing solitaire. And even also the fact that this is working at a distance, so it's embodied in Shaw. So it's embodied in his psyche. So the the uh, character of the mother doesn't even need to be there to exact this control and power. It's 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 deep in Shaw. Um. So. And then we get this strange scene of the um, the checkup, checkup from the neck up. Um, um, oh well, what what happens is there's a sort of car accident. I I didn't. I'll have to watch that again. So yeah. I'm slightly confused by it. So it's similar. There's a a pretend car accident. There's a uh, cover. As a cover to yeah. get Shaw in the hospital, so the. Um, communists could 
double check and make sure he's still under control. It's checking that the programming is working. Yeah. And we even see um, he's, he's got a kind of got he's in a bandage up and he's in a bed. And we even see um, on his food tray, I think the the um, Queen of Diamonds is on the food tray. Oh really I messed up. Yeah, it's oh. on the food tray. Sort of keeping him under, you know. They're, they're not. They don't need drugs or anything. This is the. They just need the queen of diamonds. This is the presence and the presence at a distance of the uh, terrible mother. Uh, they they even um, discuss the brainwashing and control in front of him. Well, it's because he's so brainwashed. Yeah, it's interesting to me that the they're very, they're very, they're, they're very proud of this place that they've got. It's like a sort of. I think it's like a normal house, but they've turned it over into this, in, and it's, they call it the Pavlov Institute. Um, obviously, Pavlov, a famous figure in uh, behaviorism. And, but you think of Pavlov's experiments, and they're, they're, um, it's about behavior modification. So there's that theme again, mm. and it's like, a lot of experiments on animals of making uh, um, pets or well experimenting on the child um, being less than human like a pet or a dog or something like that that can be controlled controlled and programmed and not expressing its own innate nature and we can see this in sort of when parenting goes wrong that um, the the reward punishment uh, lines become blurred and inverted mm. and so the child doesn't know where it's going it knows it's not getting any love it knows that um, but but uh, in the absence of love and empathy and care or being punished for things it may be even being punished for things that are good or, or rewarded for things that are bad it's a co total confusion there mm. and in the absence of love the child will take anything else in its place yeah so the, a child will it will take or just authority yeah they'll reach for whatever the parent is yeah. giving it as a placeholder for love and it, this is a key concept um, to get to grips with um, and that attachment that uh, identification will be even more strong because it isn't love. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's a desperate... That attachment, that an approval, because the child is, just wants to be loved. <laughs> um, so what they get, instead they will pull towards they even stronger. There will be such a strong drive yeah. uh, of attachment, and we see this in Shaw. Um, even if he hates the process, well, he, he doesn't like this, this even the thing, he doesn't he, even like his mother. Yeah. Um, um, but his need for approval. But he will embody that in self hatred. Yeah. And, um, and he can't get away. He can't get away. Like the cards are following him around, he can't get away. Um, even though he's trying, he's trying to get a job. Uh, you know. Right. So. And the, the, the next scene is him, he, he's had his checkup, and of course the, one of the political obstacles to the power of the Lansbury character is the newspaper. Oh, right. Uh, which Shaw is working at. Mm. And we, we see that he's been programmed, sent to the house of the... Uh, editor of the newspaper, who's politically on the other side. Yeah, so he, it doesn't really matter what the politics are, it, it's just an enemy. It's an enemy to, to the mother. Enemy of the mother character. Um, so Both in terms of 
uh, you know, allowing Raymond oh. life. Mm. So polit politically, uh, well, in terms of the power um, in, in the politics and her relationship with Raymond, so she, he's a threat to her power over him. And there's some interesting symbolism in this scene. Um, we see he's in bed. So it's, it's like four in the morning <laughs> um, and Raymond literally just walks into his bedroom at 4 a.m. Yeah, he's in bed and we see at his bedside table there's a, um, a chessboard, a chessboard there. there. Yeah. And, you know, a symbol of uh, there's this power play going on and uh, also it's another iteration of the Queen yeah. symbolism. The most yeah. powerful character on the chessboard yeah. is the Queen. And the, the, this sort of black and white diamondism between the unconscious and the conscious. And we also, the um, newspaper guy, he's wearing women's clothes. Yeah. So, um, the, so with this hyper feminine, the feminine world of a mother is even reaching to this potential father figure of uh, of um, of sure. Of sure. Yeah, which we haven't really mentioned so too much. So, the newspaper editor is a figure Shaw sure looks up to, and he would be a positive and healthy male role model yeah. for him. Um, and she's take, she's taken that away from him. For him to stand on his own two feet in the world. Yeah, yeah. and she obviously she doesn't want that. And we should talk a little bit, about, while we're on it, we should talk a little bit about this. This is the role of the father. Yeah. And um, and in, in the developmental stages of um, childhood, the role of the father is key. Um, so we've said that the mother is the primary caregiver, mm. but um, in order for the child to develop naturally and Healthy. reach maturity, the influence of the father has to come in, both as a kind of sh showing the child the wider world. So we have the love of the mother, but uh, that love has, of the mother has to extend to her letting go and a, a slight death, a symbolic death, of which the father both supports the mother in that letting go, but also aids, it. aids the child in seeing the wider world. Mm. So they're not permanently attached to the mother, they, so they can come and go to the mother. Yeah, so I um, think the more obvious kind of term, kind of the strings yeah. kind of springs to mind. And if this goes, is impeded, this process, we see it everywhere in the world. We've got the single mother, single parents, and, and breakups, and weak fathers. Yeah. If this process is impeded, we end up with a the kind of world we got now where, where this sort of retarded, adolescent, infantilised world of children. We've got adult children walking around. Um, um, in politics as well? Yeah. Uh, it, has, it has political implications. Yeah, which is really interesting. So I think it's important to think of absent fathers, but also weak fathers. And there's a growing feminisation of the culture. Which yeah, for very, sure. And this is the influence of that mother relationship going wrong. I mean, we often hear, uh, we talked earlier about um, uh, that the mother has power of life and death over the child. Yeah. This is a huge power yeah. and responsibility. And, um, and we often hear, like in the feminist world, they're screaming out for power. It's there. The power is there. That's the greatest power in the world. Influence on the and, children. And especially in that world, we'll see them re almost reject motherhood as a topic outright. Mm. Um, 
it, it's not on the table. Um, it's uh, we, we, we want nothing to do with it. We want nothing to do with men. Really, it's um, there must be more. This devouring control. There must be more, 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 more. Power is what we want. Well, there's all the power in the world there. There's all the power in the world there, and it's and it comes from love and empathy. It doesn't come from uh, shouting and screaming. Doesn't come from stamping your feet. Um, <laughs> Which seems to be um, the biggest kind of motif of, of the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Shouting and stomping your feet. No doubt, it's a problem. And um, we'll see some aspects of the positive masculine coming in as the story resolves itself. Um, yeah. And we, we switch to the character of... Oh, I should say something about that. When we're saying uh, masculine or feminine, we're not saying it... I think we might have said this before in other... Podcast. I'm not saying it in terms of uh, genders in the, in the, in that sense, like a man or a woman. Mm. We're saying that human beings embody both these energies, yeah. and it's important for those energies to be in balance for for a healthy life. Yeah, it's all about the balance, and this yeah. is this is also what we're talking about with yeah. the mother father yeah. relationship and the child relationship. So it's all about that balance. And the not balance of femininity, femininity and masculinity. And the real version of these things, not a kind of pseudo performing clown version of these things. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to be more masculine, I'll put a top hat on and grow a beard or whatever, you know. Um, it's not dressing up, it's, this is something internal, in, internal, in the internal life and to be embodied, you know. Yeah. Um, so we switched to the Marco and I forget the name. Eugenio? Yes, yeah, she's got a strange name. She, he does ask her, he does quibble about her name, doesn't he, or something? Um, oh, she does. She, she says, does. Oh, I prefer to be called Rosie or something. It's, yeah, yeah, so is this on the train? So they move it on the train. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, even the train is this kind of, act, it's not a passive image, it's a kind of thrusting moving you know all these other people in this kind of soup of unconsciousness and they're being direct they don't have control over their own actions and then there's this energy energetic train which by the way they are both on <laughs> both <laughs> the um, Sinatra character and the Janet Lee character um, they're the active people so they're embodying the masculine yeah, so I think the way it's filmed as well, it, it kind of leaves you uncertain who she is. Um, it kind of keeps you guessing, is she a, a secret agent or something? And she takes a bit of a lead. And we see the sort of flipping of what we've just said, you know, we're talking about masculine and feminine roles, and some dynamism there as well. So they can be bo uh, both... I mean, I'm not, again, we're not talking about gender, you're not, Sinatra is not turning into a woman. You know? <laughs> um, uh, but she, she takes the lead in terms of giving him her number. He's in trouble. Yeah. It's, it's, he's, he's going through it, Sinatra, he, she's supportive he's, and he's, nurturing. He's sweating and scared. Yeah. Um, and... And she's a bit scared, and she's being, but she's also being active. She likes him, and they, they get on, um, and so, this is a, we talked about this a bit in our um, program on the dangerous method, the this idea of the contrasexual. So it's um, so it's in, again embodying. Both these energies. Um, so then we move on to um, the senator <laughs> the scene, and the senator's still going on about the, how many comp is he allowed to say how many he's asked. I mean, this is the thing. He's 
he has to run everything by, he's the senator, he has to run everything by the Lansbury character. I think he's talking about um, how many communists is he allowed to say it is this time or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so get, get a number works out. And can he the... say the number that he likes? Um, is it allowed? So we see the potency, the potency and power of this um, um, uh, So then you kind of, you kind of got the interest of yeah. um, so you've got the the wife is the power behind the Senate so one of the highest up positions in the country and, and nothing wrong with power behind No, not, right. nothing wrong with it not, then not it, it kind of also gives us a thought of if all the all the politicians are a reflection of their parenting and their mother figure, the, the dragon mother. Yeah. Um, and what unresolved issues there are in that. And these people are the guys in charge of us and in control of all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, and really what's in control is their background and their upbringing and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, which is usually unresolved for most people. Yeah, it's really taking a pause to think why do these people want power and what might be at the root of it. Um, so he needs this approval, like, a, like this, it's supposed to be the husband. Mm -hmm. It's like, a, he, again, he's like a boy. Not me, can I? Uh, Mummy, can I say a hundred instead of one hundred and seventy-two or whatever it is? Yeah. Um, and we see lots of symbols in this room setting. Um, he, he's not dressed; he's in a dressing gown. And um, in a lot of the scenes with Lansbury, there are these sort of power figure uh, portraits on the wall as well, which is quite interesting. I think it might be Lincoln in this one. Um, so again, it's that derived power, it's images of power rather than actual power. Um, the film is quite top heavy <coughs> with you know, some of these other images and symbols. Yeah, so she's calling him a little boy and then he acts like a little boy. And, and we see him uh, sit down and have his breakfast and he, he gets out the bottle. It's different, he gets the ketchup. He gets the ketchup out. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got no, he doesn't have the palate of a grown up. Yeah, it's still good. And there, and he's sort of, there's this spanking the bottom of the, Brilliant. the ketchup like a naughty boy. It's, it's such a like, clever little um, subtle things in the film. Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. Although I, I still use ketchup, so. <laughs> yeah, we all, we all like a bit of ketchup. Yeah, Tom and Kay. Yeah. Uh, in moderation. Um, and then in the next scene, we see Marco actually engage in a fight. So it's probably in a masculine activity. <laughs> um, and he's gone round to Shaw's place, and lo and behold, the guy working there is the Korean spy from, uh, from the jungle. And um, so. It's an interesting dynamic there. It's like, well, sure, the, the Shaw character has invited him into the house and employed him. <laughs> and Sinatra knows uh, he's he's getting in touch with the unseen world. He knows this guy's a spy. And he has a. Has does a does spy. Marco know he's a spy? Is it just like a he knows something's not right? Maybe. He knows this guy is wrong, there's a threat. Um, so anyway, they have a fight, and he beats he beats him up basically. Anyway, you can't go breaking into people's houses and all that, so he ends up in the police station in jail. And <coughs> who turns up? But the uh, Rose is it Rosie? Eugenia. Rosie. Eugenie. Eugenie. Um, and she's there in this supportive. Feminine, active, and supportive role um, to help Marco. And I think this is one of one of the things we're talking about um, with this kind of balance. So she's giving him a positive feminine balance. Yeah. And, and that kind of helps him to become more conscious and balance himself. Yeah. 
And I think she even says something, she makes a joke, oh, funny place for a first date or something like that. That's, that's my dream woman. <laughs> <laughs> so... If you're out there. Um, so that, and um, we have a scene where Shaw, uh, where Marco goes to see Shaw and his room's all of a mess and uh, actually Shaw is looking through the papers on the ground and we know that, not Shaw, Marco's looking through the papers on the ground and he finds the Medal of Honour. Mm. Uh, which is an interesting symbol if you if you look at it it's kind of inverted pentagram symbol um, and also sure it, it's just chucked on the ground sure is unheroic uh, he's not comfortable with this heroic um, role and as he you know we need heroes and heroines in our lives, mm -hmm. and you know, <clears throat> and to aspire to something, and he can't embody this um, enough to win this struggle with his uh, with the terrible mother, um, and and they're starting to get along these two, weirdly, um, and Shaw's. Did they have a drink? They sit on the Yeah. Oh. Um, sure starts to open up about the relationship with his mother. And he's having a drink and he's a little bit drunk. And it, this is like a sort of th a kind of motif as well. This is him getting some access to the subconscious world. Yeah, and um, so Mar Marco's kind of there himself in a bit of a spiral as well, isn't he? Trying to. But Marco represents <coughs> somebody who can cope with this. Yeah. Um, and does he. Is it this scene where he calls him. He, he kind of talks down to him slightly as a, as a younger man in some ways? Kind yeah, of despite sort of their version. rank. Despite their rank, I think. Despite their rank. Yeah. So Marco quickly becomes the elder statesman. And father. And father figure in this relationship. Yeah. Aiding Shaw into the world finally. You know. um, and Shaw starts to talk about this, uh, this relationship he had with the Jocelyn character. And we get this kind of flashback to that. And this is a very interesting scene. Um, so we have um, this scene uh, of Shaw by, by the river. He's been bitten by a snake. And um, so we get the dragon imagery again. So does, does, does a snake represent a dragon, kind of? Yeah. Okay. And he's immobilised. In fact, it's just, um, uh, the Jocelyn character is saying, you know, you've got to stay still. But she's an active character. She's embodying the masculine as well as the feminine. Uh, and she knows what to do about it, and she's going to sort it out. Um, and she's incredibly hot. And she's, yeah, she's an attractive young lady. Um, but she has a balance, and we see this... It, as this scene develops, she has a balance of the masculine and the feminine. And she embodies this. And the shore is taken back to their uh, kind of lakeside home. Mm -hmm. And then we have the positive father figure emerge. And we even have this... Um, scene there where he's he has the the wings behind him on the, this kind of mantel base and the American flags and that kind of thing and uh, he's a nice guy and he's, he's there they're going to take care of him so he's a positive patriarchal figure 
and and does it does it kind of seems to go really well when they're getting on and then Shaw makes a joke and says can I marry your daughter yeah straight away straight he's away. in there he's in there that can't fault him um, yeah um, and then there's like a pause but it's it's funny <clears throat> because it's so desperate and quick and yeah. over and inflated so um it almost doesn't matter what the jostling he hasn't got to know the jostling character she just re represents freedom yeah and escape and escape from the this is why his relationships will tend to disaster because he's not really he hasn't dealt with this relationship with his mother so all the women that he encounters with this kind of inflated rescue figure mm. it's kind of overblown iterations again of the mother it's like well i need to be saved yeah um, so even <clears throat> there's like a little pause when he says it and then all three of them start laughing yeah because they have a balanced view of things um we, we even have this scene where um the father's daughter relationship, she sat and she's uh, Jocelyn sat on the arm of the chair with his arm around. She's been shown the masculine world by her father mm. in a healthy way. <coughs> she's, she's a balanced individual. He is as well. The, the father. The, the father is, yeah. Um, and then we get to hear about this um, the termination of this relationship, this bid for freedom. Oh, right, yeah. Um, and it turns out that the mother made, the Lansbury character made sure his one chance at a proper relationship. Um, um, she made him write a letter to break it off. So the, the, the dad, her dad, um, was a political opponent that. Lansbury's character had accused of being a communist several times, so she didn't want her son to diminish her power politically again, and as well as their personal relationship. So you've got both things going on yet again. Yeah, it's a threat. It's a threat to the ever-reaching for power. The ever-reaching dragon mother. <coughs> and, and again, we get this this language around these uh, terrible mother characters, it's derived authority from elsewhere. It's not, not, not from, this is not personal for me. This is not what I want. I don't want to ruin all your relationships with, you know, you go for all the, the women you meet. For your country. It's the country you're ruining. Again, in inflation, it's like, you will ruin the country. If you, mm. I mean, it's absurd. Yeah. If he goes out with this uh, girl that he's in love with, it, it will bring the country down. Yeah, if you're happy and you separate from him. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah. I don't know what this bit is. <laughs> why I've put this slide in. What slide have um, It's basically, oh, there's kind of a scene where. Um, She's, she's addressing Shaw about this and saying, and he's, he's kind of crunching up and he's got his, he can't take it anymore. He's got his um, hands over his ears and he's all crunched up like a baby. Yeah. Um, and it's, there's this sort of, in the way that's framed as well on camera, it's a sort of voice on the shoulder. And I think that's representing the embodiment of these ideas in, in the super ego of Shaw. So at this de developmental stage, um, when, when uh, the child develops its super ego of how to behave mm. um, in the world, this um, damaged uh, power relationship with the mother is 
set in stone at that point in the super ego of so you sure. kind of re- like it is in the programming mm-hmm. like it is in the mind control so we then move on to this um, it's really another instance of this of Shaw operating the, beyond the presence of the mother Shaw is embodying this programming and it's quite a good illustration of that because it's not even one of the plots he, he, he's in a bar and um, one of the characters in the bar mentions solitaire and the programming kicks in anyway yeah it's one of, one of my favourite scenes actually yeah. I'm, I'm not sure why just because it's, it's, a, it's kind of subtle or cute there's something cute about it yeah so it goes in the bar someone mentions solitaire so then he asks for a game of cards um, for a pack of cards and then he does it himself, so lays out the cards, and then when the yeah the queen arrives, he's he's uh, back into the brainwashed zone. This yeah, this is important. That this is Shaw's perspective, and he's stuck with it. He's it, 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 he it's his perspective on the world. It doesn't even matter if the mother's there. Mm. Uh, every situation that he's going to be in his, his life is it's going to be coloured by how that relationship went wrong. Yeah, how he's been programmed yeah. or whatever the influences are. So, and Marco is witnessing this. He's kind of, he's the aware one. He's the balanced one. He's a witness, witnessing the absurdity of this as well. And uh, one of the people in the bar says something like, go jump in a lake. <laughs> yeah. So this is what Shaw does. He, he takes it as an yeah, order. Doesn't matter if he's going to drown. Uh, he has no self. He has no self-awareness. Um, it hasn't been developed in him. So immediately he's you know, put himself in danger and just jumped in a lake on instruction. I, I think it's brilliant on the... On the um the kind of thoughts of being pre-programmed by, by your parents, your mother, and not really being fully in control yeah. of things you, you think you're doing for yourself. Yeah, because it's, it's not been addressed by her. Re- really powerful. I and I haven't read not the, been addressed by him. I'd love to read the book. If anyone out has read the book, I'd love to hear uh, what you thought of it, because... Something in the film that seems very conscious of all this stuff. Yeah, so then we get a scene with um, Marco, I think he's the army psychiatrist, and they suddenly, he's been taken, ser- some, he's been taken seriously. Mm. Like enough events have occurred. Mm. And so, and they're kind of like psychic detectives. It, 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 in this sort of role of detective, so they and they're trying to uncover this uh, thing with the cards. That this is maybe um, have they been programmed, and what are the triggers? Which is uh, psychiatric work. You know, this is the nature of psychiatry and and work on the self and. It sort of embodies Marco um, gaining autonomy and gaining control over these these uh, subconscious um, impediments, you know. So, and then we we're, we're back to Iceland again, the, the buffoon, and um, again, it's it's. He's been sh- shown these scrawled out um, cue cards. So it's literally the words, the speech of, of the, the terrible mother figure coming out like a puppet through the mouth of this uh, a, li- a literal figure. puppet. Yeah. Do, do say exactly what I tell you to say. So, and it, um, So Shaw's started to talk about this, helped by Marco, 
and he's starting to have a, something in him is starting to change. Um, and this is one of the features of this um, interrupted relationship. Uh, the, the malignancy of the mother-child dynamic is that as the child tries to break free and express any autonomy with this um, pathology, what happens is the mother character is fearful of losing control and will draw even more forces in and become more manipulative. Double down. And double down. Mm. So at the very point that the child is becoming aware of this and trying to, to try and make steps in the world or address this, that terrible mother figure is going to pull in every resource to try and shut it down. Yeah. Um, really to avoid looking at her own trauma um, from her own relationship with her mother. And one of the sneaky things she's going to try here is to use the Jocelyn character as a lure to regain control over Shaw. I mean, it's just dastardly. <laughs> um, so, um, and also, and this is another feature of it, act like nothing happened before and even blame Shaw for breaking it off. So she made him write this letter, but the way she characterises the break-off letter is, it was his he fault. was so mean to that girl. And, you know. No, no, I think she's also, she's also using it to gain control, try and gain control over Jocelyn's dad, who's yeah. a powerful political person. Well, this is, again, there's no end to the need for power. It's yeah. an unquenchable need for power. It's, it's, it's brilliant in this film because it, everything kind of happens bit by bit and builds up. And then you, you have a perfectly reasonably mumsy looking lady like Angela Lansbury. Yeah. And then slowly... It's kind, of a, it's kind of against... I mean, it's brilliant casting. It's kind of against type casting for her. Um, but that, it always, always seems to be good in the I love it in films when they yeah. when they do that. Um, she's like a, a perfectly pleasant looking mum, and she just very slowly this never ending power where she literally wants the power of America. Yeah. Her son and the country. It's just this endless yeah. first. And so uh, there's, a, there's an enticement for the senator. She uses her son as well yeah. as an enticement um, to, to, to get the senator and the daughter at the party, get Shaw under control and try and get the senator under control. And opens on the party, uh, again we get a sort of reiteration of this, everything is not as it seems theme. Oh, I, th um, I think also it's good And the childishness as well. I also love the everyone's dressed up. It's a fancy dress party, um, and I think her husband's um, John Iceland is dressed up as Abraham Lincoln from the, the pictures. From the pictures, yeah, from so, the pictures and the statues in the, the room. So a lot of this kind of power games and fights, the symbolism in the film is so overt. But it's um, it's pseudo power. This is the key thing. It's it's the, power. The, it's the and and how is she dressed is the interesting thing, which I really love. Um, so she's dressed as a, a shepherd. She's dressed as a shepherdess. A shepherdess. And she has this crook. And there's obviously there's heavy symbolism in the crook. A crook. A crook. A crooked um, crook. Crooked. Uh, events are crooked. And... Um, it is the sort of shepherding and control by the neck, by the neck. of all the characters who are at the party, That's brilliant. including their um, own son and people beyond their own son. She's the ultimate shepherd. Yeah. 
Um, so and jo Jocelyn comes in oh, before we get to jo else? Yeah, yeah, before we get to Jocelyn. Yeah. Um, the Shaw character's dressed rather strangely as well. He's dressed as a sort of boy cowboy, uh, just kind of gaucho. Oh, I, don't, uh, I don't even remember. Yeah. And he, you know, he's still looking for approval, goes up, he's trying to find out where, he doesn't go and find out where Jocelyn is, on. he's just go and ask mum where Jocelyn is, you know. So even his costume is yeah. just kind of boyish. And we get, I think we get to another, do we get another solitaire? Um, yeah, so... It's going... Did, was the, that from the... The, mo the mother... Lansbury character. Yeah, so... Someone comes, so she needs to leave him. So she, she sees him in the office. Um, and, and she, she hasn't got time to deal with him. But this is interesting, because it's... She's directly there this time. She's directly so there this time, so... She we, needs to be... When we talk about... She needs all the resources. She knows she's losing control. Yeah. Instead of just an agent mm. uh, going, it's time to play solitaire. She, she needs to be actively there. And there's even a little hint of this, uh, of sure gaining awareness and it's starting to break down because it's, it's, I noticed in this version of solitaire, when the queen comes up, kind of sideways, it's not mm. front and centre. It's, slightly it's starting to not work in the same way, <clears throat> the old tricks. Um, and then, so she, she does this just to pacify him while she, she's busy um, meeting other people. So she leaves yeah. him with the deck of cards spread out, closes the door, and then the Jocelyn character bangs on the outside door and she's dressed her fancy dress outfit is a huge queen of diamonds yeah it's like a synchronous synchronistic moment an accident here but is it an accident you know ultimately Jocelyn likes Sean wants to help him and all of this stuff um, and so immediately this uh, the big queen <laughs> is going to have an effect on Shaw, but it's it's important to say it's inflated, like we were saying about the the marriage proposal. Um, it's it's uh, Shaw is just going to race at this blind with with um, with all that he can get. I, I, I love it. I think it's brilliant. Um, and they uh, and suddenly they get the, you know, instantly they're married. Um, and he's, he's hyper excited, manic almost. Yeah. And he's going, I'm free. Everything's fine now. <laughs> um, uh, let's just gloss over all that. I can just completely lose myself in this new uh, love. But it's not, uh, it's not real. Yeah. yeah. It's a, little, a little touch of sexism in there somewhere as well, because he, he's like run along to the freezer and get some drinks, and he's like pats her on the bum. Well, you could say he's he's asserting some masculinity, which he hasn't done up until that point. Yeah. Um, so he's suddenly gained some sense of masculinity. But it's a suit. It's still a pseudo masculinity. Yeah. Um, and. There's a little aside with the Marco character and Jocelyn, and you can tell that Marco's concerned about this because he knows what a real relationship looks like, and this ain't it. And then it's clear that Jocelyn, who's also a Bangor's character, also knows that Shaw's it's not hot. Shaw's not right. It's not completely right. Yeah. Um, and I think she even says. Um, I can heal him. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's a desire to help Shaw sure there, but they know they're up against it. Um, 
And then we get to find out what the, the what the uh, programming is really all about from the, the last set of uh, programming. And then we discover, you know, he's been sent to basically kill his new fam family. His new family. So um, he's literally just got married. Yeah. And then his orders. Oh, it's to kill them both. The programming is kill the wholesome father and the lover of his life. The lover of his life. <clears throat> and um, it's qu actually it's quite well shot. This bit, I think. I mean, he shoots them. It's it's well shot. I think uh, the remake is slightly better in this scene and probably only this scene. Um, but in the original, he, he goes in, he has a gun, and I think the dad's like, what are you doing? And then he just kind of shoots him. And Do you make anything out of the milk? No. Um, no. Okay. What, yourself? Is there I don't know. It's like, a, he's, for me, it's uh, the father has a balance of the masculine. We don't see Jocelyn's mother, no. but he has a balance of the masculine and the feminine um, that's sort of holding that milk to his chest, you know. Um. Um, and, and then we get this, I just think it's a great framed shot where Shaw is bent down over the body of the um, senator mm. and then Jocelyn's coming running in and he shoots from there and we see this because we see that relationship between all three all three are in shot in some way and um, and they're being shot and we also i noticed this, this checkerboard motif on the floor oh i missed that so they're part of the chess game of the mother of the yeah I, th I think that's out of all of it that's kind of the most brutal so he's just it's cold, isn't it? It's cold. Well, he's just married this woman who he loves. Yeah. He's, and the dad is a great male role model. Yeah. And it, it's almost like we see the real horrific coldness and lack of empathy. And, and there was something pseudo about this relationship uh, that he had with Jocelyn. Yeah. It's not enough to break through. It's not enough to break through the program. Breaks, yeah, break the spell. Um, <clears throat> and then we get to what is enough, or what's uh, we we sure ends up overlooking a conference hall, and we see what basically events are running up to. So he's in a hotel room or something like that? Yeah, over the road from the conference centre. And Marco, he's, he's talked to the psychiatrist guy. They've hit on the fact that the cards are the triggers. Yeah, so he, he turns up with a pack of cards of his own. Yeah. And every single card is a Queen of Diamonds. Yeah, it's it's... It's rather, and he shows him the trick. He exposes the unconscious. Yeah, and kind of brings Shaw back yeah. to reality. And is attempting to deprogram him. Um, a bit like, uh, when are you going to have enough of this? That you do something, that you act. Mm. Um, um, yeah, so he tries, he, he basically tries to re reprogram him yeah. or defeat the program mm. by, by having 52 yeah. queens. A little diamonds. bit like uh, what happened with the Justin character and the big and the big And the big yeah. queen, yeah. So it's out, out doing it. Yeah. And then what's the next scene after that? So well, the next scene his mother. is upping the ante. Yeah. yeah right. let's, let's use a card <laughs> motif metaphor. We see that the Lansbury character has acquired, remember we said 
she needs more ammunition. She, yeah, as, she's losing control, so she needs Shaw more. is moving away, she needs to bring everything in. Yeah. To shut that down. Yeah, every every trick in a trade that she has. Yeah. And she's she's got the the big uh, queen from Jocelyn's dress. Oh, so that's still there in the background. Yeah. And this is the final programming. And she and again she's there. She's present. She's right up. In his face because it won't work otherwise. And I guess as as a viewer, you, you obviously know he's, he's just had the fifty two cards from Marco. But in this scene, you've got the giant queen again. Yeah. Um. So then you you're uncertain of who's going to win out. And the actual, <laughs> the actual dragon mother is there having to do a natural queen yeah. having to stoop and do the programming and uh, do the dirty work herself. Yeah, so there's like there's all the shackles off. Yeah. And there's no hiding or pretending anymore. Yeah. Um, so um, she is the programmer. She's gonna throw everything in. And uh and then we get this extraordinary kiss. On the lips. And it's uh, it's yeah, it's it's a love of kiss, not a mother son kiss, it's on the lips. Mm. Um so this is throwing up the Oedipal stage, um, which is when this program occurs as a child, isn't it? Um, yeah, so she's hanging on. Yeah. And this is like her last throw the dice. And so, uh, sure, the, the next time we see Shaw, He's in the building of the, um, the conference conference center. He's in the rafters. Um, so he, he's he's being programmed by his mom to kill the president nomination. Yeah, the rival. The rival. So the, then the senator. I think it's the senator is going for vice president. So then he, if the if the future president is killed. He can become the president, yeah. which means she will be the ultimate power. And he's, it's very dark. He's up in the roof. Often this is a symbol of, um, it, well, in a building, in a building, the body, the roof space is the mind, and uh, and of course, he's his disguise. He's dressed as a priest. Mm. So again, we get this solitaire metaphor, the celibacy. Yeah, version of pure. Um, yeah, oh, the it's... rules. Um, and it, the, the, we see a sort of see Marco is trying to. Trying to find him. He's trying to find him and stop this. And. Um, and we get this pandemonium again, a bit like the party scene. The the people at the conference centre are wild and acting like children and uh, just running amok. Yeah, so um, kind of um, reflects that first scene of his homecoming. Yeah, you've got this all kind of all-consuming American yeah. thing with and it's flags show. and stuff. It's show. It's display. And it kind of reads as like, what's reality, it's again the same sort of thing, what's mm. reality, uh, yeah. what's fake, what's the subconscious. Yeah, it's the sort of puppet, uh, puppetry of the political world. And, and Marco doesn't quite get to shore before he, he, he takes aim, but he takes aim at the centre and he's supposed to shoot him a certain there's a queue. Yeah, the, and the queue's good. So, and the what's what's great about the queue is is actually um, the Lansbury character that wrote the speech for the president nomination. Um, and I believe do you, do you have it written down? I can't remember what the the key words are before. But, but there was there's certainly something I'm about um, sacrificing your life before. 
your country. Um, I think that might have been one of the key oh, yeah, kind yeah. of phrases. Um, the phrase it, that he's supposed to shoot on is my life before liberty. My life before liberty. This yeah. goes down amazingly with the crowd, of course, but my life before liberty? And that's what he's supposed to What's the point to... of liberty if you don't have a life? Um, and this reflects what's happening, what's happened to Shaw. Um, yeah, so and he's just about to shoot him uh, on that. I mean, and I think this censor is called Senator Arthur. So we have a kind of king archetype. Oh, I see. And the father, you know, the, the wise king. Um, and just at the moment he's ready to shoot, he uh, shifts the aim of the gun. And first he kills the weak father and then the dragon mother. Oh uh, yeah, so he, I guess up into that moment you're not quite sure which side of the program is going to win. Or if he's going to break free. And, and then as Shaw bursts in, he's rather interestingly, he's, taken, he's got his Medal of Honour with him. Um, which he replaces round his neck. Um, but it's kind of as we know from earlier, it's really a show. It's really hollow. It's a fake honour. Yeah, it's a fake honour. Um, um, has he really won that fight with the, the Dragon Mother finally? Well, he, he doesn't because he takes himself up. He shoots himself. He shoots himself, and that's his only yeah. recourse to escaping her, yeah. even after her death. Yeah. Um, which is quite deep. Yeah. Um, so, it, what can we say about that? It, what we can say is that, that is really the seriousness of, you know, of the fight. And mm. um, if you can't undergo. He ends up dead. It's an exagger it's an exaggeration, a dramatic exaggeration for the movie. Mm. But it, this is the seriousness of the unconscious forces at work here, and they can have very damaging consequences for people. Which um, you can't, can't necessarily escape. Which is, I, can't, I guess, the end. Of yeah. If that fight is not won <laughs> at the early stages of development with the help of the father things that will get self-destructive behaviour and all sorts of all sorts of things result out of it. So um, and then it, 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 in a kind of happy ending um, we then cut to the the alternative version. <laughs> so we cut to um, Marco and um, and, Eugene. And, Eugene. and they're together um, and they've survived and, and, and got away and they, they have their relationship and it's a and it really quite really strongly relationship well it strongly shows the the benefit and the balance yeah. of the masculine and the femininity, femininity of both of them but, and how it works and that they can they can win this. You know? Yeah. It doesn't always work out the way. Yeah, it doesn't have to sure. doesn't have to go yeah. bad. Um let's before we finish, let's talk a little bit about the remake. Do you want sure. to do that? Um, if you want. There are a few things that I think it does quite well. There's maybe three or four scenes that I find quite interesting. Okay. Um, oh, what we should say is, in the in the remake, it's slightly different. The right? story is slightly changed, and some of the characters swap around a bit. Um, so Shaw is the senator in the remake, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. He's the senator, or the the potential president figure. And um, Denzel Washington is Marco. Denzel Washington is Marco. So you've got two great actors, Pat Marco, Sinatra and then Denzel. Yeah. 
and we've got um, Meryl Streep playing uh, the mother character. Yeah. And I mean, they're all amazing in it. It has to be said, it's a very entertaining film, but it's maybe a bit a bit lighter on the symbolism and a bit more heavy on the drama, I suppose. Yeah, they've kind of modernised it slightly. Um, the symbolism in the first one's so overt in places, so they, they turn that down. It's a bit um, more slick, shall we say. It's, it's more yeah. modern, it's yeah. a bit more slick. I, I prefer the original. Me um, too. The remake is more kind of consumer friendly, so a wider audience, I'd say. Yeah. Um, Does it, uh, I'll just say a couple of words about the summoners. Yeah. Sometimes there's, there's a brilliant, yeah. when we were talking about the, uh, there's a scene where, uh, oh, let's, before we say that, let's say what the trigger are. In, this, in the second film, the trigger is simply uh, enunciating the name of Shaw over the phone line. And um, it's, uh, They've added a middle name, so it's Raymond Shaw, Raymond Prentice Shaw, and Prentice is quite an interesting word there, like apprentice. Yeah. So you're there to serve. Yeah. Shaw is there to serve. So the, junior the, partner. The mother character. He may be up for being president, but it's an extension of the power of the mother, and it, it often. Um, in this um, arrested version of that relationship, um, we see we can see the child being in these kind of roles, a soldier in the world, in the world for the power of the mother. Um, it's a, that's quite a common motif. Um, yeah, quite a powerful. One. Yeah. <coughs> uh, there's also. I quite like the scene where he's having the the checkup scene in the in the second movie, where there's this. It's actually the the, the hospital thing is actually part of his hotel suite, <laughs> and we get this. Uh, it's quite Kubrick like. We get this room within a room thing, and there's actually a painting on the wall of the room. Oh, wow. that it's in <laughs> so it's it, it's a kind of never ending tunnel sort of reality tunnel um, and the scene in your own mind yeah which is that repetition and that repeat trauma uh, and the key words and um, there's also just as Marco is struck trying to challenge Shaw and get to shore and attempt to deprogramming him. Um, and he's in Shaw's office. There's a scene where Shaw holds up uh, this uh, magazine cover and uh, him and his mother are on the magazine cover, but uh, they look like a couple. Mm. Uh, yeah. And it's it's this public life as well, this persona. Um, I, I think that's that's um, reflected in the final scene as well. Yeah. So at the congress, I think they have the other nomination or the other person dancing with their partner romantically, and then who's sure got? He's only got his mum. Yeah. So he's dancing with his mother. I would say. It, you know, no, if you go and watch the first one, why not, you know, watch them both and compare them, I think. Because things that it will throw up. So there's probably, there's all sorts of things, imagery you probably missed during this. And it may, it may throw up something personally for you, which you might find useful, you know. Um, something to think about. Um. So, and also I quite like the, the, End, end scenes of the uh, of the second film where um, the Marco character is, is with the Eugenie character in the second film 
and they're at the to actually revisit the site. Yeah. Of the uh, torture and the programming. Like the Mancunia yeah. Islands. Um, in, in reality, mm. in the rational light of day, and he's uh, talking about the Marco characters saying something like that he just wanted to get to the water. Mm. And then we see him walk towards this water. And as we said earlier, water is often a kind of symbol of the unconscious, and uh, which is used in both films. Yeah, I, I, I think in the second one, I prefer the scene where um, Shaw murders the wife and dad, um, yeah. because they're at their, their lake, lakeside house, and he's killing the dad in the lake. So you have this return of the motif of the lake yeah. and literally drowning him. Um, and then she comes out afterwards. And I think even just watching as an audience member, it's more, it's, it's more dramatic. There seems to be a bit yeah. more going on. Um, so I prefer that in the second one. And the surface of the water acts as this kind of liminal divide. Um, and there's this flipping as well where... Shaw is in this unconscious state. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but he's drowning the consciousness of the of the father and the daughter. Yeah. And the people that he loves, um, because he not can't address his own unconscious. That's why the, why I think both films are, are pretty brilliant. It's a couple of little subtle things that you might miss unless you're really kind of thinking about it. Yeah. So you kind of you can connect with the subconscious. And I, I again, I like the way the, the the second movie ends when he goes up to the water, and uh, the sea is very calm. Mm. And I think he puts some he puts symbolic up, items yeah. in the in the in the shallow I tide he, there. He puts the medal on him. Yeah. And the photo of the platoon. And so he's uncovered this unconscious world and he's putting it putting it to rest having brought it to life put it to sea so um, I think we can maybe unless there's anything more you want to add I think we can maybe leave it there yeah I can leave it there I just say both films are definitely worth watching and um, worth watching in a kind of psychological perspective yeah and have a look at the symbolism and stuff yeah, like that see if See if you can see any other symbolism this that um, comes up for you, and see if this resonates. You know, see if this, see if this resonates in your own life. Yeah, you know? so I think you know neither of us are experts, but we'd like to um, we like to think, we like to read, and if you know anyone gets something out of this, makes you think a bit. Yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, we hope to do some more of these. Um, yeah, we'll do a few. We'll do a few of these. Um, yeah. I don't know what next. Okay. Bye for we'll now. Be back. Bye for now. Take care. Thanks for watching.